Hey everybody, Pastor Jay Maynard from The Gathering. We are so thrilled that you're checking us out online and we trust that God will use this online resource for your growth and sanctification. But you know, we always do provide these resources in conjunction with your participation in your local church. If you're local to Windsor and you don't have a church, please join us here at The Gathering, but please do plug in where God has planted you. Thanks again for checking us out. God bless you and enjoy. He's able to do abundantly more than all we ask or imagine. He is awesome, and we are grateful. So good to see you here this morning. Thanks for joining us uh, at our online service here at the Gathering Church Windsor. Thanks for participating, and a special uh, greeting to all the moms in our audience today. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. During this current lockdown here in Windsor, Ontario, we're holding services at the Gathering in our church parking lot, 
on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock and online at thegatheringwindsor.com. Uh, the service is available to us online anytime after 9 a.m. on Sunday morning. Thanks again for joining us. We hope that next Sunday, May 16th, is the last Sunday of the current lockdown. We will keep you informed, however, through our church website, so please check thegatheringwindsor.com for uh, information next week. If you wish to support the gathering with your tithes and offerings, uh, by all means, visit the church website and click on the links either for online giving through the PushPay app or your e-transfer giving through your local bank. The God we serve is a gracious God who loves and forgives and heals and restores. Masud and Manija came to us from Iran a number of months ago. They started attending the gathering church. We had the privilege of introducing them to the Savior. They were both born again and baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit here at the Gathering Church. Well, recently, Masood took a new job in Toronto, so they'll be spending most of their time in Toronto from this point forward. And so today, we just want to pray for them. We want to commission them as they continue to spread the gospel wherever they go in Toronto. God has provided a job with benefits. God has provided a place for them to live. And we believe that God will also uh, lead them to the right church where they can continue to make a difference for Jesus Christ and the gospel. When we pray for them in just a moment, uh, we will when we pray in just a moment, we'll include them in our prayers as they begin their new journey in the city of Toronto. Now, if you would, please turn with me in your Bible or your Bible app to Psalm 40. I'm going to be reading the first five verses of Psalm 40 with you, and you can follow along in your Bible or your Bible app. This is a Psalm of David. He writes, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us, none can compare with you. Now, would you join me in a word of prayer, please? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we bow in your presence to worship you as the God of heaven and earth. You are the high and holy one. There is, there is none like you, Lord. You're loving and kind and good. You are holy and righteous and true. You've invited us to freely confess our sins to you so that we might find forgiveness and healing and hope in the name of Jesus. And so we come now, Lord Jesus, to confess our iniquities and, and to seek your forgiveness, the forgiveness that you so freely provide through your death and resurrection. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. On this Mother's Day, Lord, we're more than grateful for the ladies in our lives. We honor all the women who've made a, a strong and lasting impact on us. Some of them are married, some are not. Some are mothers, some are not. But each and every one of the women that you've placed in our lives is special. And we honor the women in our community today, in our church, and in our families, of course. We pray that you will continue to pour out your grace and favor, your love and affection upon each and every woman on this day. These are challenging days, but we believe that every mom and every grandmother, every woman can excel in their calling because of Jesus and because of the riches of his grace. Lord, we also pray now for Masud and Manija as they begin a new chapter of their lives in Toronto. We love them. We thank you for them, Lord Jesus. We entrust them to you. We, we commission them for ministry in Toronto and ask that you would use them to further advance the kingdom of God, especially, especially among the Iranian 
diaspora of southern Ontario. We, we commissioned them to more fruitful gospel ministry and, and pray that you would fill them to overflowing with your Holy Spirit and power. Uh, Lord, let the world see your fruit in their lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. And we pray all of this in the powerful and strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. ago, our family had the opportunity to travel down to Tennessee. We loaded up the kids, packed up the van. We were prepared for this 10-hour road trip. But less than an hour into the journey, we heard those four words that every parent dreads. No, it wasn't, I need to pee. It was, are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. We haven't even left Michigan Yet. And of course, it wasn't just one time, are we there yet? It became this repeated refrain every few minutes. Are we there yet now? What about now? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? No, not yet. You gotta wait. No, no, not yet. We still have a long way to go. Eventually, the irritation, the frustration began to build in me. And one time they said, how about now? Are we there yet? And I snapped and I said, no, no, we're not there yet. Why can't you just be patient? And then I realized my response to them was not very patient, nor was it filled with kindness. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. No, not, not the rest of our vacation, but these ideas of patience and kindness as we continue on this series of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 and 6. And yes, it's also Mother's Day. And so maybe you're watching and you're, you're a mom and you're going, oh, great, a sermon about patience and kindness on Mother's Day. Absolutely. Look, I know I need more patience. I know I need more kindness towards my kids. This is not just a Mother's Day thing. This is not for moms. This is an everybody, every day thing. I mean, I used to think that I was a pretty patient person until I had four kids of my own. I need this just as much as anybody else does. We all fail in being patient. We all fail in being kind. We all have so much room to grow. And that's what this series is all about. That because of the gospel, because of what Jesus has done for us, he set us free from the penalty of sin. But we've also received this new life by the Holy Spirit. And, and, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can live this new life. We can live by the power of the Spirit. And these, these qualities, these characteristics that are listed, this fruit of the Spirit, they can grow and they can develop as he produces them in us. Pastor Jay walked us through joy and peace last week, and he said kind of this big idea that because we live by the Spirit, we must know what the fruit of the Spirit looks like. If we're going to produce these qualities and have him produce them in us, we've got to know what they truly are. And then we're going to continue with that same big main idea today, that because we live by the Spirit, we must know what the fruit of the Spirit looks like. And we see the fruit of the Spirit listed in Galatians 5.22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so specifically today we're talking about patience and kindness. 
We're going to look at what they truly are and how they're actually produced in us. So the first point for us today is that because we live by the Spirit, we must trust the Spirit to produce patience in us. We must trust the Spirit to produce patience in us. But what is patience? It's important that we, we understand what this is. You might think that you know already, oh, I know what patience is. Or, I thought that I knew what patience was, but I did a lot of study this week, and I learned quite a bit. Patience is different than simply waiting for something. And we all wait for things all the time. We're forced to wait. That's an activity that we do. But it's interesting because Psalm 40, verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. So they're, they're, they're linked, but, but there's, there's something different. Waiting is something that we do. All, all day, all the time, for the rest of our lives, we're going to wait. We wait at the green light or at the red light. We wait for it to turn green. And we wait, once it does turn green, for the person to actually put their foot on the gas and drive. We wait for that cable guy to show up sometime between 8 and 5. We wait in the doctor's office. You're in this waiting room, and then you get to wait in this other waiting room. Then you get to go to the actual little waiting room as you wait for the doctor to come. We wait all the time. Waiting is something that we do. It's, a, it's an activity. But patience is an attitude that we develop. It's how we wait for things. We all wait all the time, but we don't all wait patiently. Think about going to Costco on a Saturday. Some of you are going, yeah, that is a test of patience. Yeah, absolutely. Why? Because there's going to be so much waiting involved. There's going to be waiting in line to go in outside. There's going to be waiting as you're trying to get your items. There's going to be waiting in at the checkout line, just waiting, 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 waiting. And it can be super frustrating. It can be annoying. You can just be like, oh, this is dumb. I don't like this. What's going on? It's taking so long. They didn't have the, the cereal that I wanted. That person cut in line. I'm in the line with the, the cashier that's in training and has to call the manager about every little issue that comes up. Of course, that's not patience. That's irritation. That's impatience. I mean, first of all, did you actually expect anything different, though? You chose to go to Costco on a Saturday. What were you expecting was going to happen? You'd be able to just walk in and out seamlessly in just a couple minutes? And we'll talk about this a little bit more, but, but expectations play a huge role when we're thinking about patience. Are those expectations even reasonable? So waiting is the action. Patience is the attitude. One person has said that patience is the capacity to endure what is difficult or disagreeable without complaining. Ooh, without complaining. Without being grumpy, without whining. And that's not natural for us. We, we're naturally complainers. We're naturally whiners. We're naturally grumpy. We're naturally irritated. We're naturally annoyed because we're naturally sinful. That's why it's the fruit of the Spirit is patience. It's different. It comes from God towards us. So patience is the capacity to endure what is difficult. So patience and, and, and endurance seem to be closely linked together. You might even say that patience is, is a sort of committed endurance, that there's a goal involved, and that because of that, I can endure these difficulties. What, any number of goals that could be. It could be you know, athletic. Maybe you're trying to, to coach a kid's sports team, and, and they're, it's, all of them, it's the first year they've ever played that sport. So your goal is you know, reasonable. Uh, hopefully, by the end of the year, they all understand all the rules. They know how to play the game, and maybe we even win a game. That's a goal that you have, and so because you have that goal, you can be patient. You can endure the difficulty, the struggles, the learning, all along the way because you're working towards a goal. Or academically, let's say you're wanting to learn a language. I want to learn, I want to be fluent in Russian for whatever reason. And all you know how to say is das badanya. That's it. Well, the goal is, is being fluent in the language because that's the goal. I can be patient with myself as I learn, study, and, and attempt to figure out this language, how to pronounce things, the grammar, or if I'm teaching someone the language, right? Because there's a goal involved. And ultimately, we think about our, our, our goal, what we're waiting for, we're waiting for Jesus to come, to return, to make all things new, to make all things right, to, to fully and to finally bring the day of salvation. We're waiting for it. That, that's the goal that we're waiting for. And because that we can endure difficulty and discomfort and things that are disagreeable to us without complaining, without being grumpy, we're waiting for Jesus. And since it is Mother's Day, why don't we talk about parenting for a little bit? Not, not just moms. Moms are great. We love you. Cool. Uh, absolutely keep it going. But also dads, everyone who is a parent, we need patience as we parent because we, we need committed endurance because we have a goal. 
And it's actually a long-term goal. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. See, uh, there's a long-term goal in parenting. There's all kinds of, 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 of milestones and, and separate mini goals that you have. Absolutely, I would like my kid, you know, by the time that they're six to understand, you know, respect for adults or how to use, you know, polite manners or by the time they're 10, they know how to do this and responsible. Sure, that, that, there's all kinds of goals like that. But training up a child is, is being in it for the long haul, haul because the goal is to raise mature, responsible, godly adults. It's a long process, and it's a long process that we're called to be committed to with endurance. So we don't have to lose our minds and be so tightly wound and be so irritated, so agitated, so frustrated, not, not if, but when our kids do something or many somethings, that are frustrating, that are annoying, that are wrong, that are incorrect because we have a long-term goal in mind. They don't meet our expectations in the moment. We don't have to totally lose it. We can have patience with them as we rely on the, as we rely on the Holy Spirit. We trust him to produce this in us and we remain committed to their growth. And kids, again, remember, you can learn to be patient with your parents as they seek to raise you in the way that they're trying to do as they seek to do their best. After all, you think about patience, you think about parenting, you think about our Heavenly Father. Think about how crazy patient God is with all of us as he works in us. Think about all the mistakes that we make. We fail all the time. We don't meet his standards every day, and yet he's committed to our growth. Philippians 1, 6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. I'm sure of this. He started this. He's going to complete this. He doesn't bail on us. He doesn't just run away when things are difficult. He patiently endures with our brokenness, our failures, our sins, our struggles. He shapes us and he changes us to make us more like his son. I'm very thankful for that. So patience is committed endurance. Additionally, patience is anchored in trust. Trust in God, trust in his sovereignty, that he's actually the king of the universe, that he is ruling, that he is in control. So I trust his timing and I trust his plans. Whether I understand or I enjoy all of those things, I may not understand his timing. I may not enjoy all the things that are happening, but I trust him and I trust that he is in control. And I trust that he is wise, that he is good, and he is actually working things out for my good. As Romans 8, 28 says, and we know, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. So patience is this attitude of saying to God, I trust you while we wait. I trust you while we wait. But have you ever asked yourself why you get impatient? Like taking some time to assess. Like we know we get impatient, but why? Why is it? I mean, Why am I getting so irritated? Why am I getting so frustrated so quickly? Why am I so annoyed while I wait for these things? Have you asked that? And we could talk about any number of things. I just want to talk about two things real quick. Um, One is unmet expectations, and the other is a lack of control. Things are not happening the way that we want them to or the way that we would like them to, whether that's at home with our families, whether that's at work, whether that's at school, whether it's the government, whether it's the pandemic, whatever it is, we don't like it. And so we get frustrated. We can get impatient. And also, lack of control. We want to be in control. We like to manage. We like to have things, our ducks in a row. We want things to be in control. And we don't naturally trust God to be in control. And if we're honest, I mean, we probably wouldn't say this, but we actually want to be God at times. We want to manage. We want to orchestrate. And so we get frustrated when things happen the way that we don't want them to, or we feel like we're losing control. But as we trust the Spirit, again, to produce patience in us, we've got to surrender our desire to be in control and to manage every little thing and say, God, I trust you. I trust you. You're good, and and you know what's best. You're in control. You could do You do such a better job than I could ever do. Many of you are familiar with the story of David in the Bible. And if you're not, um, I'll give a little summary for you. So talking about King David. So first, actually, you had King Saul. So Saul was the first king in Israel. And he he started off pretty good. 
but uh, went sideways decently quickly after that. And so David was anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the next king of Israel. God promised him, you will rule as king. You're going to be the next king. But you know, that didn't happen right away. David had to wait. And he didn't have to wait just like a couple days or weeks or months. He had to wait many years before he would actually rule as king. And he endured significant difficulty and discomfort during that waiting. So Saul got really jealous of him. Saul tried to kill him multiple times, forced him to actually flee and to escape and to hide in the wilderness. That's difficult. And at one point, David actually had the opportunity to kill Saul. Saul was vulnerable, and he could have taken the throne. And some of his men that were with him were saying, this is your chance, David. Here he is. He's vulnerable. Go, take the throne. God's put him into your hands. But what did David do? He said, no. I'm not going to reach out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Nuh-uh. I'm going to be king one day, but Saul is still king today. I'm not going to interfere with God's plans and God's timing. I'm not going to resist what he has set up. I'm not going to take things into my own hands here. I'm going to wait, and I will leave it in the capable hands of God. I will trust him to take care of me. I will trust him to deal with Saul the way that he wants to deal with Saul. I will be patient. Man, seems like a really fitting and relevant response for us during these days as we struggle to be patient during this whole over a year. We're saying, I trust that God is actually sovereign and that he is ruling, that he's in control and that he is good, so I will learn to wait patiently. And that's what we cry. I say, Lord, help me. Help me to do this. Help me to endure difficulty without complaining. Help me to not be grumpy and, and, and just irritated all the time. Holy Spirit, come produce patience in me. That's what we're asking for. That's what we need. And you know what? He will. He will produce patience in us, especially as we seek him, as we ask him to, as we yield ourselves to his power in our lives, and as we take time to remember the gospel and actually apply the gospel to our lives. So when we are impatient, when we are annoyed, when we're frustrated, when we're at wit's end and we don't know what to do, just stop for a second. Stop. Breathe and think. Think about the gospel. Think about God. Think about God's patience towards us. How he doesn't lash out at us in anger. He doesn't judge and punish us immediately for our sins and our failures. Could you imagine if he did that? Every time we screwed up, boom, thunderbolt. The Lord is slow to anger. He's gracious and compassionate. He's abounding in steadfast love. He's so patient to us, and he will produce patience in us as we learn to live by the Spirit. And not only will he produce patience in us, but he will also produce kindness in us. So we transition into this second point. Because we live by the Spirit, we must trust the Spirit to produce kindness in us. Remember, these are the fruit of the Spirit. This is the work of the Spirit of God in our lives. This is not something that we just fabricate on our own. He works in us to shape us and to change us to produce these fruit in our lives. And so we talked about kindness. You say, what is kindness? Oh, I know what kindness is. Come on. I know that it's good. I know that's great, all this kind of stuff. The Bible tells us that we should, that we should be kind, that we should pursue it. Proverbs 21, 21 says, whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. That's great. That's awesome. All right, kindness. But do you really understand the depths of kindness, what it is and what it isn't? It's been said that kindness springs directly out of love. Love is listed first in the fruit of the Spirit on purpose. That since we love, since we love, kindness begins in our minds as thoughtfulness towards others, and then it moves to being tangible expressions of that love. So you could say that kindness is love in action. It's this idea of practically serving others. It's, it's a way that we demonstrate or prove our love to other people. I mean, because you can say, I love you to someone 80 times in a day, and that's nice, but kindness shows it. That, that could be a, a writing a card for somebody. It could be a, a gentle back rub. It could be dropping off flowers or a meal at somebody's house. It could be staying up late to help your kids with homework and being patient as you do it. It could be calling somebody just to talk. There's no agenda. Hey, I, I was thinking about you. I just want to, I want to check in. How are you? Let's just talk. Kindness. It could be mowing your neighbor's lawn. 
kindness. And we know what it's like when we experience it. When someone is kind to us, we, we, we like it. We enjoy that. We say, wow, that was so nice. They're so kind. Some opposites of kindness, as we, as we probably understand, but meanness, cruelty, hostility, cold-heartedness. That's not kindness. That's the opposite. And patience and kindness are actually closely linked together. It's no accident that they're listed right after each other in the list of the fruit of the Spirit. So you think about, go back with me now to Costco, and you go, I don't know if I want to go back to Costco, but just hold on. As we learn to wait patiently in that crazy place, we can show that we love God and love others through kindness. We can actually speak to and, and act in ways to fellow customers and employees so that they actually experience love. So maybe that's in the aisles. Hey, you know what? I'll grab that for you. No, it's okay. You can go first. Or, or you're talking to that cashier that's in training. Hey, say, you know what? This is a crazy work environment, and especially on a Saturday, people are pretty nuts and they're probably not very patient and kind to you, and we can actually encourage them. Say, hey, way to go. Keep going. Keep learning. Sooner or later, you're, you're going to... You know, you're, you're going to improve and this will be a little bit easier for you. You won't have to call the manager all the time. Keep going. You're doing a great job. Thank you for your help. We can show kindness. This is what we're called to do as God's people. Colossians 3.12 says, put on then as God's chosen one. Put on then like, like a coat. Put this on you as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. You say, yeah, okay. The Bible tells us to Put on kindness. But, but why? Like, yeah, the pastor says be kind. The Bible says be kind. There's, there's a sign on, uh, for one of the schools down the street that says be kind, stay safe. Why, though? People will say, why? Why should I be kind? Why should I tangibly show love to others, especially when they don't deserve it because they haven't shown it to me? They're annoying to me. They're mean to me. They're hostile and cruel to me. Why should I be kind? I asked my daughter this question. I was, I was pretty happy. It was kind of like a proud parenting win. I said, Mackenzie, why should we be kind to people? I mean, like everyone. Why should we be kind? And she said, well, Dad, because God is kind to us. And I said, yes, yes. We respond in kindness because we've received kindness. And so again, it's the gospel. It's, it's, it's understanding the gospel and applying it in our lives. As we're pursuing these qualities, we, we've got to think about the gospel. We've got to apply it to our lives. Ephesians 4, verse 32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Be kind. Forgive you know, these horizontal relationships that we have, interpersonal dynamics. Be kind to these people. Forgive these people. Confess and forgive. Why, though? Because God has forgiven you. Because God extends kindness towards you. But, 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 but they don't deserve it. They let me down. They dropped the ball. They betrayed me. They didn't listen. They, did, they, 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 yeah, yeah. People are terrible. So are you. We're all terrible. Think about all the times that we have blown it, all the times that we have made mistakes, all the sins that we have done, how we don't deserve forgiveness. And yet think about how God treats us with kindness, tender heart, and he forgives us. Not, he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve, but he forgives us totally, completely for our sins, past, present, and future through his son, Jesus Christ, and what he did for us on the cross and his resurrection. Forgiveness, kindness, so kindness is love in action, but you could also add to it that kindness is this idea of benevolence, that it's like, it's bonus. It's, it's beyond what would be expected or deserved. You don't expect this. You don't deserve it, but I'm going to show kindness to you anyways. Circling back all the way now, back to this story of the life of David. We saw great patience on display with David, right? He was committed in his endurance. He had anchored trust in God. And he endured a lot of difficulty, but I want to look at that same story from a different angle, different perspective now, because King Saul had a son. The son's name was Jonathan. Don Jonathan and David became best friends. They were, like, they were tight. They were buddies, you know? Now, that, of course, put Jonathan in a tough spot when King Saul started becoming jealous of David and tried to kill him. My dad is trying to kill my best friend, but my dad is the king. Add to this, Jonathan would, in theory, be the next in line to the throne because he was the son of Saul. But he knew that David had been anointed to be the next king. So what is he going to do? 
And he loved David. And he actually ended up proving that love by showing great kindness to him. During this story, Jonathan went out of his way to speak up for David, to try to defend him to his dad, then to, to warn him and to even protect him and to help him escape so that he would survive. He was a true friend that showed great kindness all the way along. He actually put himself in harm's way. And he forfeited his opportunity at the throne. Like, who does that? Who does that? that, that that's pretty incredible kindness. I could, I could be king, but I'm, I'm going to let you be king. Because I know that's what God has decided. I'm going to show you kindness. I'm going to help you out. There's one time that when David was out in the wilderness that he actually went by himself just to find him and to encourage him because he loved him so much. You say, okay, great. David's great at being patient. Jonathan's great at being kind. Cool. How do I get more patience? How do I get more kindness? Is there some kind of pill that I can just take and that'll just, they'll appear? Man, wouldn't that be great? I wish it was that easy. Take two of these things and in the morning you're going to be totally patient and you're just going to be just oozing kindness to everybody. Fortunately, it doesn't work that way, even though I would like it to. Uh, but we've said today and all along in the series that, again, it's the Spirit of God who produces these fruit in our lives. It takes time for these things to grow and develop in our lives as we learn to live by the Spirit, as we learn, again, to say no to sin and, and flesh to desires and yes to the Spirit and the desires that He has given us after making us new. But I do have two quick tips that we can do in our daily lives to help uh, aid the production of these fruit. God's the one that produces them, but there's things that we can do to create an environment, to make space for, for production of these fruit. The first one is, again, we've talked about this already throughout this sermon, is, is actually like intentionally focus on the gospel, to think about the grace and the goodness, the patience and the kindness of God towards us, how he treats us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and how he lavishes his grace and his kindness on us even to this day as we struggle along. Jesus said that a bruised reed, he would not break. A smoldering wick, he would not, he wouldn't snuff it out. He is patient, he is gentle, he's kind. So you think about the gospel, think about Jesus, think about him dying in your place, suffering for your sins. So when you feel yourself moving towards impatience, you feel yourself, uh, frustration and annoyance is, is mounting, you're tempted to be mean, you're tempted to be hostile, you're tempted to respond with cruelty, you stop and you wait and you remember the gospel and you say, wait, I can be patient, I can be kind because of what Jesus has done and because the Spirit of God is alive in me. That's the first tip. Secondly, Pray. Pray. Seems like a no-brainer. Seems really basic. But seriously, pray. Spend time with the Lord asking him to produce patience and kindness in you. And I will admit, I, I have not done this a whole lot lately, specifically saying, Lord, help me to be patient. Lord, help me to be kind. Produce these things in me. But do it. Like, that's a tip. Like, actually pray. God, help me to endure without complaining. Help me to surrender my desire for control. Help me to trust you completely. Change me. Help me to put off hostility and cruelty and to, and to show others kindness that you have shown me. Make me more like your son. I mean, that, that's a prayer that God is going to answer. Of course he will. And so we remember that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he's committed to completing the work that he has started in you. He's not left us alone in this journey. He is perfectly patient and he is abounding in kindness. He is the one who's going to produce patience and kindness in us. So the question really is, are you going to trust him to do that? Are you going to trust him? And are you going to make space in your life for him to actually shape and change you? So I want to challenge you. Don't let this simply just be another sermon. Okay, that's done. Click it off. Oh, yeah, my hour at church is done. Move on. No, no, no. I want to challenge you. Carve out some time this week, this week, to have real conversations with you and God, real conversations about this, you and your spouse, with uh, you and your kids, or you and your parents, you and your friends, whoever you got to do to talk about how can I improve impatience? Where am I impatient? Where am I unkind? 
have these types of conversations and pray together asking God to change you, to work in you. Ask him to change you because he wants to. He wants to make you more like his son. He wants you to grow in patience and kindness and he will help you along the way. So let's ask for his help right now. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true. We thank you that you are perfectly patient, that you are abounding in kindness towards us. Thank you for, for sending your son Jesus to die for us. Thank you for, for, for giving us your very spirit to make us new and to help us learn to live this way, this true way that we can live free. Forgive us for our impatience. Forgive us for our lack of kindness. Forgive us when we're hostile. Forgive us when we're just irritated and we complain and we're grumpy. Forgive us for our desires to try to seize control and when we fail to trust in your goodness and in your sovereignty. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us. Help us today. Help us to grow in patience and kindness. Help us to, to yield to your spirit's impulses and desires. Help us as we get frustrated, as we get annoyed, Help us to pause and to think about the gospel and all that you have done for us and continue to do for us. And help us to remember the abundant kindness that you show us. May our lives and our homes be filled with patience and kindness. And may we trust and follow you. We ask that you would produce these fruit in us for your glory and for our good. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hope